Welcome back to the London Futurists podcast. In the wide and complex subject of biological aging, one particular kind of biological aging has been receiving a great deal of attention in recent years. That's the field of epigenetic aging, where parts of the packaging or covering, as we might call it, of the DNA in all of our cells alters over time, changing which genes are turned on and turned off with increasingly damaging consequences. What's made this field take off is the discovery that this epigenetic aging can be reversed via an increasing number of techniques. Moreover, there is some evidence that this reversal gives a new lease of life to the organism. To discuss this topic and the opportunities arising, our guest in this episode is Daniel Ives, the CEO of Shift Bioscience. As you'll hear, Shift Bioscience is a company that is carrying out some very promising research into this field of epigenetic aging. Daniel has a PhD from the University of Cambridge and co-founded Shift Bioscience in 2017. Daniel, welcome to the London Futurist podcast. Thanks for having me, David. Thanks for joining us, Daniel. Daniel, first things first. Why have you dedicated so much effort over the years into the prospect of indefinitely long lifespans? The reason has changed over time. The first reason was I was a biochemistry graduate looking to the future. I had a certain set of skills that I developed. This was around the time of the financial crisis. I had an idea that I was going to go into drug development, use my skills to make some sort of real world impact. But because of the financial crisis, all of the interesting jobs in that direction had vaporized instantly. And so I think I was just looking around and I came across Aubrey de Grey on the TED platform when TED was relatively new. He gave a talk called Ending Aging, which was such a spectacular topic. Imagine you've been working in biology, you've been looking at chemical pathways and various aspects of molecular biology, and then you have somebody present a coherent framework for what is aging and we can do something about it. And it just blew me away. I'm not the only person that watched this talk and basically made a life decision on the back of it, which was I'm going to commit myself to this task for quite a substantial amount of time. For me, I was almost compelled once I thought that I could do something about this with my skills and basically get leverage out of those skills. It seemed almost like a cool thing to do. That's not like a responsible decision-making process. What's cool? Let's do that. I didn't have any better alternatives than to do what I thought was the most exciting. And so I chose to go that direction. So that was the very beginning. And then along the way, you realize it's a lot harder. There's many hard technical goals, but solving aging, I don't want to put it on a pedestal, but it's certainly one of the harder ones. That's a process realizing how big the mountain is and maybe you should have put walking boots on. You sort of have to test your own commitment periodically. Am I really up to the next stage? You know, am I going to get up to the next base camp or should I turn back? I guess there's various rationales that you implement, but the most exciting source of energy for me now, it's almost the collision between what's going on with space exploration and this field. There's all these exciting developments, Starship going up there and we might be able to go to other planets and all these sorts of things. But the problem is the biology is the weak link in the chain. We could put ourselves out there, but even if you're in your prime of life, space does terrible things to your biology. You're still spam in a can. Spam in a can. People that have been out into space for too long, you get loss of bone, loss of muscle mass. You're in a really bad state. I think people have to lie down for like multiple days even before they can get up. So if we're actually going to realize this dream, there's a lot of catching up to do on the biology front. So initially it was like, oh, wow, how can I fuse this interest in this whole space thing to what I'm doing? There is actually something really exciting that is enabled by biological age control. Imagine in the future that we can control the age of the cells and therefore we can control the age of cells across your body. It's a very different future in that scenario versus what we have at the moment. So right now we're just born, we're on a particular point in space. We've got a hundred years and then we're gone. The moment you've got biological age control, this great delta of time and space opens up in front of you. 
The time dimension should be obvious, right? You just survive more time on this part of Earth that you live. But the fact that you can actually survive time means you can survive the journey across space. So imagine this delta opening up where you can actually travel to different parts of the universe intact. And basically the entirety of the future becomes synonymous with your future. It's like an incredible menu in front of you versus basically what we've had historically, which is have a certain point in space and a certain amount of time available. For me, that's transformative. Daniel, can I just interrupt for a second? It may be taking you off at a tangent, but don't you think it's more likely that when we really start exploring space beyond the moon, maybe beyond the solar system, it won't be human bodies doing it. It'll be either minds uploaded into machines or maybe our robots. Human bodies would have to change beyond all recognition to survive long distance travel. I'm not saying this is the best solution. It's almost like the old fashioned solution. We're going to keep everything that we like about human bodies and try and take that with us beyond the cradle of Earth. So it's almost like this old-fashioned, highly capital-intensive way of travelling. I'm sure there's better solutions. But once we've got biological age control, that is an option. I think it's an exciting option. There may be things out there and you want to see for yourself, not through some sort of LCD screen. I think it's an option that people will find very exciting. So the same sets of technological improvements bioengineering improvements that will allow our bodies to regain some youthfulness, the same set of ideas can augment our body and enhance our body in all kinds of other ways to allow us to go places where currently we wouldn't dream of going. We might send robots, but we wouldn't send ourselves as biological entities. In other words, this technology isn't just about living longer. It's about opening a huge new set of possibilities in all aspects. The other dimension is... People that get sent to space at the moment are in their prime of life. There's been a few private individuals going up, but you basically need to be at the top of your game physically to be out there in a meaningful way. And so at the very least, you need to be young just to be out there to make the most of it because there's a lot of side effects to being out in space. For instance, being elderly on Earth is hard enough. Imagine putting somebody elderly into space and then they've got to deal with all of those issues on top and get back to Earth, the whole high gravity re-entry, this would kill you. A lot of these things will kill you if you're not in your prime of life. For me, it's almost necessary to have this as like necessary scaffolding if we're actually going to go out there. So it's not just living longer and be able to go further. It's just, are we even going to enjoy it? So I might send you a calendar invite for 40 years time that we'll meet in orbit around the moons of Jupiter and continue this conversation. I'd like to aim for that, yeah. But before then... Let's come back to my rough and ready description from the introduction of what epigenetic aging is. Can you give some more accurate details as to what this whole excitement's about? So I won't profess to be an expert in epigenetic aging. I have a narrow interest in epigenetic aging, which is something called the epigenetic aging clock. This is an invention, it's about 10 years ago, so back in 2013 at UCLA. Steve Horvath was basically on a fishing expedition throughout all of the molecular layers of the cells and the body for a biomarker of aging. He tried every type of omics, genomics, transcriptomics, metabolomics. There's all these different layers of biology that you can survey in like a high throughput manner. But he found that within the methylome, which is basically DNA can get methane groups added or removed at different sites. In its entirety, this is called the methylome. Within the methylome, there is a high accuracy biomarker of aging that works across multiple tissues in the body. Before the discovery of this biomarker, you wanted to investigate aging. Is this gene involved in aging? Does it cause aging or does it stop aging or reverse aging? You would have to manipulate a mouse and wait quite a long time to figure out whether that mouse lived longer or shorter. You'd have to do lifespan analyses. But once you had this biomarker, you can now do way more experiments based on the methylome. Once people had a clock, it basically allowed people to ask questions much, much faster. I don't know, are mitochondria linked to aging, right? You can look at the clock, you can manipulate mitochondria and what does the clock do? Are telomeres linked to aging? You can look at, does the clock respond? All of these experiments started to happen, but the most exciting thing about having a clock was that it discovered an intervention that can not only slow or stop aging, but can reverse aging to zero. This is called the Yamanaka factors. 
epigenetic aging is really our gateway to lots more experiments in this field using this clock, this epigenetic clock. And because of the clock, we now have a way to reverse the age of cells called Yamanaka factors. The caveat being these Yamanaka factors aren't perfect. They do things that aren't particularly helpful. But this is why epigenetic aging is a particular focus area. And what exactly are the Yamanaka factors? So Shinya Yamanaka in the mid-2000s was on a hunt for genes within our cells that can convert adult cells back into stem cells. I think around the time, the US had legislation banning the use of human embryos in research. So there was a real pressing need to like find an alternative. We need to sort of mimic human embryos. One way to do that is try and make adult cells stem cells again. It's called induced pluripotent stem cells. Shinya Yamanaka actually with a relatively small staff and a great experimental design, managed to find four transcription factors that together convert adult cells back into stem cells. So this was in the mid-2000s, these four genes. These four factors basically turn adult cells, like your skin cells, back into stem cells. Now, what wasn't known at the time was these stem cells are entirely rejuvenated. We didn't have a clock. Shimon Yamaka didn't have a clock that he could use to show this was the case, but it was noted. These stem cells looked like embryonic stem cells, behaved like embryonic stem cells. And to the extent that embryonic stem cells are basically young, like they're day zero, there was this feeling that these cells were young, but it wasn't until the advent of the epigenetic clock in 2013. Actually, it took a few years before somebody applied the clock to these Yamanaka factors to see what happened. And then it was established. These factors reverse age according to this robust biomarker of aging, the epigenetic clock, back to zero. So this is one of the fruits of having a biomarker of aging or an epigenetic clock. We managed to find that there's this set of four genes originally discovered for something else, but they actually can rejuvenate cells. They're not the perfect solution, but we've got something by the tail in the dish, which means we can induce this phenomenon and we can investigate it in more detail and find out what's going on. Why do you say it's not the perfect solution? Is it because we don't want to turn back into embryos? We just would like to go back maybe 10 or 20 years in our life cycle. Yeah, one of the issues is I don't want to take someone that's older and then turn them into a young bag of stem cells without any function. You might live a long time, but you won't be able to do very much. You won't really enjoy that. You won't even perceive anything. That's one issue. The second issue is that if you express Yamanaka factors in animals and you basically give the cells the ability to be a stem cell within a living body, the stem cell basically decides to create a body without a body plan. It's called a teratoma. It's a multi-tissue tumor where you have different types of tissue growing all out of that single stem cell which started it. And that's just not something you want anywhere near a therapeutic that you're going to put into somebody's body. If we're going to try and make you younger, the price of that can't be cancer. You don't want to take old people and make young cancer patients. Nobody's lining up for that. These Yamanaka factors, they're exciting because we've got something by the tail in the dish that will allow us to investigate what is the specific rejuvenation pathway, what is the specific pathway that converts a skin cell into a stem cell. It's the obvious thing to do, figure out all those details and basically selectively activate the rejuvenation in the absence of this tumor-causing activity. I just wanted to ask if it's true that you are in Shift Bioscience looking at some alternative factors or trying to find alternative factors that will have the same age reversing potential, but without some of the drawbacks. It might even be better in some uses than the four that Shinya Yamanaka originally found. Yeah, that's correct. It's not just Chef Bioscience. It's many other well-funded companies. The writing's on the wall. We have something by the tail, but it's not perfect. Let's find an improved combination of factors that can reverse the age of cells without causing all of these major problems, not minor problems, major problems. This seems like the obvious thing to do. So we're trying to find this alternative set of factors. There's an enormous number of experiments that need to be done. I think that's one thing to get across. There is actually a subset of the four Yamanaka factors, just OSK, that have been used to rejuvenate cells and in some cases reverse disease phenotypes. If we're to consider all other combinations of free transcription factors, which are the type of protein that Yamanaka factors are, there are 365 million combinations of alternative transcription factors or combinations of free transcription factors. 
which is just an enormous amount of experimental load. We're not anywhere near being able to do that in the wet lab. So how on earth are we going to survey all of these different combinations, which we need to do? We're going to find the safest version that's able to go across the body. We need to prove this out experimentally. How on earth are we going to do that? And there's various solutions to completing that exploration. I can only really speak with authority on our solution. It's a really exciting solution. That shouldn't mean it's the correct solution, but it's something that you can be excited about beyond the actual application area. Within the last year, there's been a couple of developments in machine learning that actually allow us to go into the impenetrable black box of the cell and actually abstract something meaningful and put it in the computer. Historically, biologists have made do with some local area of mechanism, which is still surrounded by a terrible black box we don't understand. But you can comfort yourself that this gene activates this gene and that activates some enzymes. You sort of get comfortable in a small world, but you're still surrounded by this vastness of unknown. So that has been basically the case up until now. What happened last year is that the application of transformer models, which are a type of foundational machine learning model, and also graph neural nets, were used to basically understand the relationships between genes in real cells in the wet lab to the extent that you can actually create a virtual version of what's going on between those genes that actually correlates with the real world cells. These are virtual cells with between 0.2 and 0.3 correlation with the real world cells. You might think 0.2 to 0.3 is not very high, but it's amazing it's even above zero. Above zero is cause for celebration because once you put things on a computer, the throughput goes up enormously. It's not even like 10 times or 100 times. It's way more than that. What we could do experimentally in the wet lab Let's just take an example. What we were planning to do in the wet lab was about 35,000 experiments over about two years. What we can do now with these simulations on board is 10 million experiments in two years. So you can just see that the scale of exploration is just vastly different. And this actually allows us to explore this vast landscape of different combinations of genes to see if they're rejuvenative. 365 million, we can't explore all of those, but we can explore 10 million which is a sufficient survey on the landscape to say, look, what's useful, what's not so useful, the valleys in the landscape, and then we can iterate on those things that are working. Daniel, what was this development? Obviously, this is not DeepMind's AlphaFold model, is it? This is something different. Who is it that came up with this use of transformers? The most visible example is called SCGPT. It stands for Single Cell GPT. It's the application of the transformer model, not to language, which is GPT, the well-known chatbot, but the application of that transformer model to single cell data, basically single cell gene expression data, to the extent the transformer learns the relationships between genes. It looks at cell A, these five genes are up, these 11 genes are down. Cell B, these 25 genes are up, these 40 genes are down. It looks at enough cells that it can stitch together. When this gene moves, this is the impact on the remaining genes. It's called SCGPT from Bo Wang at University of Toronto. This was like a defining moment. We've been asked for a long time, what's the impact of SCGPT on your field, which is for really deep molecular biology? We didn't have a very good answer. Bo Wang basically created this bridge between this new world that's very fast moving and our application area, which was trying to find new interventions for rejuvenation. But you can also do this for things that aren't rejuvenation. You can maybe disease states you want to reverse back into healthy states. This is a very fast moving area. Basically what we're doing now, ironically, we're generating lots of wet lab data, not to find rejuvenation genes initially, but to improve our simulations as soon as possible. So the analogy is two people, they've got an ax, they've got a tree they need to cut down in one hour. One person just starts hacking away immediately at the tree. The other person just starts sharpening the blade. And so the analogy is we're going to make a simulation that's good, right? Sharpening the blade. And then after 55 minutes, that person's still hacking away at the tree. The other person picks up their axe, cuts down the tree in one fell swoop. That's what we're doing. We're generating as much wet lab data as possible to retrain the simulations to make them as accurate as possible versus the real world so that we can find these combinations of rejuvenation genes faster. We're feeding the simulations to make them better. So a correlation of zero would mean there's no correspondence between what happens in the model and what's happening in real biology. 
the correlation of one would mean that everything that happened in the model also happens in biology completely confidently. And you are somewhere in the middle, but that's already extremely valuable because you can do so many of the experiments inside this model. Are other companies doing the same thing? Are they also using this SCGPT in a similar way? Have you added extra machine learning goodness on top of that model to give yourself a unique perspective? Yeah, I think all of the, the people that we worry about are using these models. So SCGPT is one example. I forgot to say there's another example called Gears from the Leskovec lab at Stanford. So this is a graph neural net. So it's just a different type of foundational model you apply to the same type of data. So these models are used. They're open source. They're out there. And there's two points of leverage. The one is it's no good having a model if you don't know if that model got younger or older. You need a really good measure of aging. So something that we have at Shift, which is unique, is a highly accurate cellular aging clock, a single cell aging clock. We actually built this thing originally to do more wet lab experiments, because if you can do experiments in single cells, you can do vastly more experiments than you could with an epigenetic clock, which basically uses populations of cells. We made this clock originally for wet lab experiments, but with the advent of these cell simulations, we can actually use that clock in the simulation to say, did the simulation get older or younger? So that's something that's unique to us. I think there's others that work with these models and they have binary measures of aging. So it's just, did this get younger and did this get older? Which is great. You can find everything that makes the cell younger, but then you can't stratify within what could be quite a large group. You want the very best rejuvenation combination that does it the fastest or does it the safest. You need a way to stratify. Being just younger or older is not particularly helpful. I think there's others that use functional assays, which are relatively low throughput, so you can't really survey very much. You end up back at the stage that epigenetic clocks find themselves at low throughput. You can't do a comprehensive exploration. I guess as far as the development of the machine learning models, Bo Wang is actually one of our advisors. He's able to bring any developments in these models that might help this exploration from the top straight to the front line. We do our own things as well, which is generating as much data as possible to make the simulations better. It's just a very simple thing. If your data is good and you've got more data, these models can start to do new things. This was the case with GPT. They just scaled the model and it started to have unpredicted behaviors where it started to behave in a much better way just through scale. So that also applies to the area that we work in, just have more data. And it has to be high quality data. That should be a given. But just have more data is also very helpful. You have a single cell aging clock. Is a model of that included in the model that you're working with, or is it a real world biological thing? Just to explain what a clock is, because it might sound very mysterious. If we look at a process, like aging is a process, so you have some cells and over time they change. If we want to create a biomarker of aging, we're simply trying to find features in those cells that predictably change with time. That's the essence of it. What features in the cell predictably change with time? To the extent that if I'm given a new cell where I don't know what its age is, and I can basically look at the features and predict this is the age of the cell. There's some regularity I picked up on. This single cell aging clock, we've basically looked at different time points. We look at chronological time, but we also look at biological age, which is slightly different. We actually use epigenetic clocks to define biological age. Basically, we just say what combination of gene features predictably changes across chronological time, but also biological age. And then that is the clock. It's just this collection of genes that if I was given an unknown cell, I just look at this collection of genes. And I say, well, what are they doing? Okay, this is where they are. And this is what the age of the cell must be. There's a lot of sophistication in how you create that list of genes to make sure you choose the right genes. But that's the essence of it. It's just features that behave predictably and reliably across age. I'm often asked about uses of AI to improve healthcare. I've now got a great new example to add to the set that I share with people. We talk about the use of AI to improve drug discovery. But this is now the use of AI to accelerate finding new interventions, the right transcription factors that might have a big role in reversing aspects of aging. Yeah, and David. Just to hit home the difference that these models make, we costed out the wet lab version of what we need to do, basically the old-fashioned version of what we need to do, which is not old-fashioned. 
it's the very latest in experimentation and high throughput in the wet lab. It would take 50 years and $10 billion to complete the work program. With the simulations, assuming we can get their accuracy up through this successive round of experiments, we reduce that to less than $10 million and two years. That is the difference. You take something that is basically unviable and make it viable. So it's not like this is just a nice bonus. We can do a bit more and we might find some more combination of genes. This exploration isn't even viable until we have these simulations on board, unless we're willing to wait 50 years and, you know, we're going to pour countless billions into it. For me, this is like enabling technology. We can actually do a proper exploration and experiment and find the very best biology, as opposed to something that was barely scratching the surface with a traditional version of this experiment. And your tool could be used by other researchers who had different ideas on how to reverse aspects of aging. Your single cell aging clock is something in principle you could provide as a product for others. You're correct, David. The reason that we don't supply it at the moment is that we're in an incredibly competitive space where any advantage is existential. So we can't give away our advantages too easily. Otherwise, somebody will just use that tool and we will cease to exist. There's a limited time where that tool is our unique advantage and we use it to find these genes. But the moment we basically completed the exploration, there's no reason why this clock can't be used by others to ask specific questions or test slightly different strategies. It's just we are a commercial entity and we live or die by our capabilities. So at the moment, this isn't something we can put out there. We're not going to hold on to it forever. There's no need for that. But right now, it has to be something that is proprietary to us. So Daniel, the kind of simulation that you're doing will presumably be available across all sorts of other aspects of medical science in the coming years. One of our earlier guests, Andrew Steele, said that we shouldn't think about how long it is between now and longevity escape velocity, that being the time when every year that passes, medical science gives you another year back. We should think about how much money it is between now and then. And he came up on the back of the fact packet, really, with the number of $100 billion. So if we spent $100 billion mostly on experiments, we could get to longevity escape velocity as soon as we could spend that money sensibly. With the sort of simulation technology that you're talking about, presumably you could reduce that $100 billion down to a much, much smaller number. Is that right? There's a promise here that we can do far more experiments faster and at a reduced cost. We're confident this is the trajectory. But ultimately, I'm a scientist. A good scientist proves these things out. And you're never 100% sure even when you do these experiments. There's always various variables beyond your control. But this is certainly a cause for huge excitement internally. And we see this as a big opportunity. I think the real world version just isn't viable as far as we can tell. It's mostly the time dimension that's not viable. 50 years. All of the things that can happen in 50 years to destabilize a project it's just very hard to keep something with a steady North Star for that amount of time. I think there is a minimum level of funding that's required just to see this through in its fully flourishing form. Where exactly does that money live? Is it all the clinical trials or is it getting to these particular genes across the different parts of your body which require different drug solutions? It's like an engineering problem. There's certainly a lot of capital requirement, but if we just sort of suspend the current circumstance, imagine we found these genes they exist. It's been proved beyond any reasonable doubt these genes exist. And now it's a simply a matter of getting these genes across your body. And there's all sorts of benefits that entail once we get there. I actually think the emotional brain, it's like the monkey brain that's been dormant. You emotionally suppress aging, right? To your darkest depths of your conscience, because it's a massive downer. Things are hard enough, let alone thinking about that at the beginning of every day. So you sort of suppress it. At the moment, it's like an absolute reality that you're going to face. Was it death and taxes? There's two absolutes, right? Death and taxes. The moment that's not an absolute, the monkey brain or emotional brain is going to go absolutely wild. People are just going to behave irrationally and try and get hold of this stuff one way or the other. It's the impact technology can have. Once it exists, it's almost like a before and after moment. And then you're compelled to distribute this technology because it becomes life and death in certain circumstances initially and then increasingly becomes life and death in every circumstance. Things have to change very quickly, otherwise people are going to start behaving irrationally. I'm just trying to paint the scene. It takes very little to catalyze a complete switch in what the current system is. 
So maybe flesh that out for us a bit more. How do you imagine it might play out in the years ahead? So let's zoom, I don't know, maybe a couple years ahead or three years ahead. We found a combination of genes. And not only does this combination of genes work safely in a single cell type, it works in multiple cell types. And in fact, it can get to most different cell types across the body without any safety issue and actually rejuvenate those cells. This is proven out in, say, a mouse to begin with. This mouse becomes a celebrity. It just keeps going. That's all it has to do, just keep going. And then a reporter shows up just to interview the mouse in like a jokey way. The mouse is doing great. They just put a voice over it. You have this situation and now there's two paths ahead of you. One is the traditional path. Let's call this the existing box of healthcare systems. You deliver these genes to different parts of the body to help with certain diseases. So these are very specific drugs. So we're trying to get to your kidney or we're trying to get to your brain, or we're trying to get to your eyes to protect your sight with vision. These are very specific drugs to get to certain parts of your body. That's the traditional route. We limit the exposure of your body to these new agents because we only need to deal with a disease and then we don't create the risk of side effects across the disease. But enough of those together amounts to an armada of therapeutics which can get to different corners of your body. You can put all of those things together. And I'm not saying it would be cheap, but that's one route. The other route, and this is actually developing at the moment, is what's the best way to get leverage on this biology or this technology? It's to get these genes working across the body all at once. Why wait? Why wait for things to go wrong where some things might not be reversible? Why not get this rejuvenation happening in all of your cells as soon as possible? There are people working on this whole gene therapy platforms. Let's load up these genes and get them across the body as far as possible. You might have heard of Brian Johnson, this famous high net worth individual in the States is basically dedicating large sums of money per year to keep himself young. These people are flying themselves out to certain parts of the world where they have the medical sovereignty to do what they want. They'll sign a waiver. It's basically personal sovereignty over your body to experiment. And they will take some of these experimental therapies and deliver them across their bodies. It's almost this orthogonal system that's developing. Ultimately, we find the genes. It can go in all of these different directions, but some people aren't going to wait for a bunch of therapeutics to be approved for different parts of the body. They're going to want the benefits as soon as possible, and they'll be willing to fly out to your jurisdiction and get the benefit ahead of somebody telling them it's safe. There is a lot of hazard that presents itself here, which is, does someone really know what they're doing? Were the people delivering the therapy responsible? Because there's a huge conflict of interest if money's involved. So there needs to be some policing mechanism so the whole thing doesn't get shut down and that creates an unnecessary delay as far as this technology having a real world good so this these two ways things might pan out that's the way that i see it and do you think that these treatments will deal with all aspects of aging or do you think it's possible that it might bring back our vitality in some aspects but we'll still be accumulating aging damage in other ways yeah this is a really good point These therapies won't be perfect. Nothing is. When you try and solve a problem, it's never a perfect solution. But it's still a pretty big step forward. I think that's the main thing to emphasize. But let's just focus on the things that this approach doesn't fix. One of them is, as you get older, you lose cells. We have certain cells in our body called stem cells. Their job is to replenish cells as you lose cells in the day-to-day activities you have. For whatever reason, your body does tend to lose cells. You have stem cells to replenish that. Unfortunately, as you get older, the stem cells don't quite keep up. Your tissues do atrophy over time. You basically have a cell loss component in certain parts of your body. I think dopaminergic neurons in the brain are one example. So in Parkinson's disease, patients with this disease have basically lost a large proportion of these dopaminergic neurons. Normal people also lose these neurons. It's just Parkinson's people lose too many. So there's like a natural rate of loss and then there's too much loss which manifests as a disease. There's so many other examples of this. The cell loss component isn't fixed by cellular rejuvenation because if something's no longer there and ceases to exist, I can't rejuvenate it and make it back to a young cell. There still needs to be a cell. So there's sort of a drop-off point beyond which I can't help, which is we lose the cells. For this reason, if you want to avert cell loss as soon as possible, You want to rejuvenate cells way ahead of getting old or getting any diseases when you've already suffered that cell loss because I can't do anything about the lost cells. 
getting sales younger, even when you're young, makes sense because cell loss is a problem we can't deal with. There are solutions to this, like inject stem cells from the outside, maybe trans-differentiate cells, which have a different identity into the cell type that's been lost, maybe convert an immune cell into a neuron in the brain. But these things aren't by any means simple at the moment. Cell loss is one issue. The other issue is mutations in your DNA. This is both in your nuclear DNA, which is where most of your DNA lives, and your mitochondrial DNA, which is this vestigial genome that exists separate from your DNA. Once you have damage to your genome that then becomes part of your genetic code, this technology doesn't have some reference map of what the genetic code used to be, and then it changes all the bases back specifically to what they used to be. We can't do that. DNA damage will be something you carry forwards. Even if we rejuvenate your cells according to all the hallmarks of aging and epigenetic clocks, this DNA damage component remains. And this may present an increased cancer hazard because you're basically inheriting a lifetime of mutational burden. I don't know if this is out of date, this finding, but I think every cell in your body experiences like 10,000 mutation events per day. The idea that you're going to correct 10,000 things therapeutically in every cell of your body is just unviable. Evolution has a solution to this problem, which is to get back to a blueprinted genome, it basically sacrifices the individual. It's just the germ cell that makes it across the next generation, which is basically the blueprinted genome with a tiny bit of mutation for evolution. And then you create a new organism based on that blueprinted genome. And that's quite an efficient way to do it. But when you're an individual, (laughs) evolution's answer isn't particularly palatable. That's why we're even talking about this. We're not accepting the cars that evolution has given us because we have the faculties to do something about it. But this is a really difficult problem. I suspect that there will need to be a cell replacement component that basically you have a blueprinted genome from the outside, which is maybe artificially held like in a lab. You grow cells on the back of that and then you replace tissue with blueprinted genomes when the cancer risk becomes too high. I sort of see that as a secondary solution. This is fascinating. The possibility is that as a result of the epigenetic reversals, which you are pioneering amongst others, this will give people hope. They will see that a significant part of aging can be reversed and this can arouse attention and more resources will compiling into the field to address the remaining aspects of damage of aging. So it will no longer just be a minor industry, it will be something huge. Maybe the largest industry in the world with the largest public activist community behind it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Final question for me. We aren't all like Brian Johnson. Some of our listeners may say it's all very well for a high net worth individual to jet off to some foreign expensive location and be rejuvenated. When is it going to be viable for the ordinary man and woman in the street? Yeah, so I'm going to just take you through how I construct a timeline because it's very easy for me to say a number and then later on that doesn't turn out to be the case. But I'll just go through the thought process. Firstly, we need to explore all of the different combinations of genes that are out there, mostly for safety. We shouldn't rush the science just because we want to get a therapeutic out there as soon as possible. It's short-termism. It's like the child with the cookie in front of them. Just don't eat that cookie and in about five minutes you'll get free cookies. Basically, if we don't do this safely, we shouldn't do it at all because it's just going to blow up in the future and it's going to ruin everything. We're going to do a proper science experiment. We're going to explore all of the combinations to the extent the technology allows. We're not going to rush that. We think it's a two-year process right ahead of us. And that's bullish. So let's be conservative, say two to three years. So that's just base camp one. We know what the biology is. So once you're at base camp one, you know what the biology is, then you need to prove this out in organisms, not just cells in a dish, but you want to test this in a mouse. You might want to go beyond a mouse, things that are more similar to humans, maybe non-human primates. And that's anywhere between two to three years again. And I'm not the expert in those timelines because I haven't done this program. I haven't planned this whole program right now. Let's say three years plus another three years. And now... We're at the stage where we're going to dose our first patient in a phase one clinical trial, not to rejuvenate them, just to show that there's no safety problems. I think each phase of the clinical trial process is, let's say, three years again. So phase one is three years. Phase two, which is testing rejuvenation, is another three years. And then phase three is just more of phase two, just a bigger version. 
So again, another three years. So the counter is now at 12 years. Actually, no, no, wait a minute. Two to three years for discovery, two to three years even before we get into the clinic just to do things in animals. So that's six years. And then we put nine on top of that. So we're looking at 15 years just before anything can get approved by a regulator. If we're going to do this responsibly, we shouldn't rush it. So let's do this responsibly. So 15 years from now to we've got something approved. But once it's approved, is it approved for a tiny part of the body, like maybe the eyes? Or have we been able to partner this technology in multiple directions so we can get to lots of the body at once? So let's be conservative. We've only got this to one part of the body. And now a lot more people have woken up. This is this zero to one moment. This type of approach has proven itself out in a certain application. And now other people start firing things up and it could be anywhere between 12 to 15 years again to get to the other parts of the body. There's a lot of time here. I'm a little bit more bullish. I think as we move forwards, this is such an exciting development in technology that it sort of naturally spreads like just through interest from journalists on its own, just the nature of what's happening here. I actually think by the time the first drug gets to market, it won't just be one drug for one part of your body. It will be a decent chunk of the body has actually got a solution. And then there'll be like these little corners, which were technically hard to get a drug to that we're still working on. But now there's a whole industry behind you, like on this engineering problem. And simultaneously, you've got the Brian Johnson and these whole body gene therapy platforms that bring the timescales forwards a lot. But I think we've got to get this right. We don't want to choose the shortcut approach and risk safety and risk credibility because the industry that will be necessary for the therapies that the everyday person wants, we need an industry to get that right. The early adopters can risk a clunky version of this as far as maybe it doesn't work. The rejuvenation is not as much as we think. But if it's going to be for you and me, like this can be for everybody. There's going to be vast numbers of people. This has to be absolutely bulletproof. So we need industry on board. We can't be risking any credibility up until that point. I think 15 years is a bullish case, 20 years, maybe if people are a little bit sluggish, but I think this is going to have a positive momentum. It's going to be like a snowball where the more real this becomes, the more people pile in, the faster it goes. I think there'll be a natural acceleration, but it's still a decent chunk of time away. But that's not crazy. It's not like 50 years away. It's within a reasonable time frame. Well, final question for me then. 20 years is not all that long, but as you said, if a very large number of people, let's say the majority of people, switch from where they are now, which is not knowing anything about all this, and certainly not believing that aging could be cured within a number of decades, if they switch from that to thinking, wow, aging could be cured and my dad, mum, grandma needn't die, there's an Opry Winfrey show and suddenly everybody believes this. Everybody absolutely believes that aging can be avoided. Then the political climate is going to change overnight and there's going to be massive demand for therapies to become available, not just to be worked on, to become available. Then you're going to have a very interesting position where scientists are going to be saying, hang on, we have to do clinical tests. We can't do this overnight. And everybody else is going, the hell with that. We want this now. And you'll have some people who are actually going to die in the next year or two unless they get these therapies. And they'll be saying, well, look, try it out on me. I'll be a guinea pig. And the world might progress very differently. You know, it might happen a lot quicker. This is what I was trying to say earlier. The emotional brain or monkey brain kicks in because it becomes life and death. It's like fight or flight. Internally, I basically describe this moment where all hell breaks loose. This is this moment where this is more than having a big committee decide it's like no it's life and death i think you could call this the longevity singularity that's one way to phrase it we are very close to this so internally we see these things happening and we see that it's like the beginning of the big bang there's a level when people recognize this is real maybe they see somebody else take it or you know whatever it is people become irrational at that moment and it has to be handled very carefully. And so some of the things that we perceive as obstacles will fall away very quickly. The way that when we were confronted with a COVID pandemic, which was life and death, the whole system changed. Like we were all locked in our houses. Things changed very quickly. So I think once that psychological switch kicks in, there's going to need to be some very careful handling and some changes in the way that we do things. Otherwise, there'll be a scenario where it gets pushed underground and basically it's illicit to get the good stuff, except it is actually the good stuff. It's not like a euphemism. 
So, dear listeners, you heard it here, the longevity is singularity, not just a technological change, but a psychological, sociological, political sea change that might happen more quickly than people had expected. And like the other singularities, it might be wonderful or it could be terrible. So we have to prepare the public so that when this change is looming, we can respond creatively, thoughtfully, positively, rather than running around as if hell really has broke loose. Just a last thing to say, David, is that we can get really excited about all the consequences and the great delta of time and space. But if you just bring this all down to ground level, the conversation with the everyday person is, would you like to wake up tomorrow and feel better than you did yesterday? That's basically it. Do you want to feel better than you did yesterday? They might have had a disease yesterday and they feel better because they don't have the disease. They might be free of disease, and they feel better than they did yesterday. They're now towards what we would call robust health or even bordering augmentation. You can get really animated and energetic about all these things, but ultimately, do you want to wake up and feel better than you did yesterday repeatedly? And that's all we're talking about. And it's an incredibly rational thing when you sort of talk on that basis. Well, let's look forward to this happening as soon as is practical, but not by rushing. Thanks very much, Daniel, for sharing your vision with us and also setting out a clear, credible roadmap for how we might collectively get there. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel.